Hi there, my name is Nana Kapoor and I'm a performance coach to high achieving entrepreneurs and young leaders. In this series, I'll be speaking to entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs on the one book that has impacted them or shaped their perspective towards their goals. These are people who read, introspect about what they learn and thus I call them intropreneurs. I hope their stories and learnings from the best books inspire you to become an intrapreneur too. Stay tuned for today's episode and I look forward to hearing your feedback. Hey guys, on this episode, we have Viktor Kiosev, born in Bulgaria, studied and worked across the world. His past is far from traditional. He started his career with international hotel brands and restaurants in several countries across two continents. After seven years in hospitality, he decided to move into the startup space, working on building companies, ground up in the event planning, education, social entrepreneurship, photography, hospitality, and real estate space. His hospitality and entrepreneurial experience serves to be a killer combination as he's able to understand the complexities of different cultures while working on business modeling, marketing, and fundraising. Today, he's the chief operating officer of a pre-Series A startup, Greenhouse.co, a technology platform helping startups and entrepreneurs find reliable corporate service providers in APAC. He has seen the company through since the beginning and has been involved in a few fundraising rounds. His role revolves around operations, strategy, business development, fundraising, and so much more. He's a high achiever, always looking to upskill his knowledge by reading and educating himself. He releases a newsletter called The Struggle, where he shares his learnings and views about startups, entrepreneurship, and technology. If you're keen to subscribe to his newsletter, I'll put the link in the description below. Lastly, he's a good friend that not just myself, but many people look up to. We start off today's episode by talking about how he reads a gazillion books a year, and we move on to talk about the one book that has truly inspired him. I'll be providing some snippets of the book in between, and I'll be asking him some questions on his experience and thoughts being in the startup space. Entrepreneurs, I hope you enjoy this episode. So Victor, how are you? I think that was the best intro I ever received. Oh, I think awesome. I'll, 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 I'm going to get it later. I'm going to use it on social media. I will media. send thank it to you. you so much. <laughs> thank you. Oh, good. And thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to our conversation today. Really happy to have you. So let's start off this podcast by telling our listeners, guys, Victor is simply obsessed with learning, right? So I want to start off by asking you, how many books on average do you read a month or a year? Um, I don't count on a monthly basis because some months are more crazy than other. Um, but I, I use Goodreads a lot, which is like IMDb for books, uh, for the people that don't know it. And Goodreads has this really basic, but cool, uh, challenge where you can challenge yourself about how many books you're going to read. And that's a good way for you to have a sense of how much you read annually. So I typically read between 25 and 30 books, um, every year and as as podcasts are getting better, um, I mean, the quality of the podcast and, you know, and the people that are running podcasts is increasing. I see that um, I'm struggling a little bit uh, to follow all my favorite podcasts and to hit uh, about 30 books. Not that it's important to be 30, but it's just, you know, I've been doing it for a while. So I was hoping that I can continue. But now it's so many, so much great content out there. Um, it, it's getting harder uh, to keep up with all that. Right, right. Awesome. But why did you start or when did you start reading actively and what got you into that? I think um, I think my father uh, used to read a lot. Nowadays, not that much, but he used to read a lot when I was younger. Even my mother, uh, not as much, but still. So both of them used to read. And uh, when I was in primary school, I remember that we had this very tiny library because our school wasn't that fancy. And in that library, we had this one notebook. And in that notebook, every page was the name of one student because it was a small uh, primary school. And and usually people would have like two, three rows of, of books that they borrowed from the, uh, from, from the library. I think I was the only student in the history of the primary school that actually finished the entire page and the page after that. And uh, at some point, you know, the lady needed to start like a second uh, notebook just because of me. Uh, because I was just trying to, you know, get as many nice books as I could. Unfortunately, uh, the books that we had back then 
weren't that great. So I ended up, you know, just just going after the same books and rereading them. So I think, you know, I I guess uh, the second half of the primary school mm -hmm. years is when I started reading a lot, and then um, obviously it continued ever since then. I've been reading a lot. That's awesome. Yeah, if this is a habit that someone can cultivate when they're younger, I think it serves such a great purpose in the long run. Right. Awesome. Now, moving on to the book that has impacted you. For the listeners out there, if you've not read this one, it's The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. And in this book, Ben talks about how when he reads self-help books, the other books that are out there, he thinks that's not the hardest thing about what's happened in someone's career, right? For example, setting a goal or learning how to set goals is not the hardest thing. The hardest thing is laying people off when that goal is not met. So the hard thing about hard things is that there is no recipe. Thus, in the book, he doesn't provide any formulas, but he shares the experience from being an entrepreneur, CEO, and his, he owns his own VC as well. So this book is very real, to say the least. For those of you in the startup space, it's a raw read and encompasses the struggles about starting or owning your own company. Victor, how has this book impacted you whether professionally or personally after you read it i think as you mentioned you know most business books are typically structured in the following way there is a problem x and uh, a leader y steps in he sets the vision they work hard and and things work out great for everyone and you know and, and that's great and often it's inspirational to an extent um and for a long time i was reading that and you know i enjoyed reading this kind of books but the moment I, I started running my first business, I, I realized that it's, it's nothing like that. It, it, it's not about, you know, setting up the vision. I mean, of course you set up a vision. And of course that's important. I'm, I'm not saying that it's not, but there are just so many other things that, that um, are slowing you down or so many obstacles, challenges, struggles. Um, it's just the nature of, you know, when, whenever you're trying to change something, whenever you're trying to uh, make some sort of an improvement to an existing product or, you know, to solve things in a different way, it's just hard. People used to do things in a certain way, and now you're trying to bring this innovation. And everyone's trying to slow you down. Your employees are slowing you down. Your investors, you know, might be against you, you know, if you have too many radical ideas, you know. So so it gets quite difficult, right? So when I read that book, um, it I don't know, it was just like, uh, oh, my God, you know, actually all these ideas that they had in my mind, um, there are other people. That, that thing the same way. And it's not just me going through all that. So I think it was the first time that I got, I got external validation that it's actually hard. And it's not just me feeling that it's so hard because at some point I was thinking maybe, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm not capable. Maybe, you know, there is a lot of other people that are doing great and um, they don't uh, experience these challenges. And most probably there are, right? I'm sure there are some lucky guys that, you know, started something, worked out immediately um, for sure. But majority of people actually face a lot of challenges. So I think the moment I read that book, I was like, oh my God, you know, it's actually real. You know, everything that I'm experiencing and here you go, this uh, very smart person that's been through a lot um, that is, you know, kind of explaining what happened, um, how he faced it as a person, how his employees and the team and his leadership team faced it. And I just found it so inspirational that I, I just started rereading the book every couple of years and recommending it to all my friends. And I think every entrepreneur that's been an entrepreneur for a while has read the, the book and has a bias to like the book. It's very rare to find some entrepreneurs that don't like this book or don't know about it. But then, as you said, it's not a book that any other person would like to read. It's not the most pleasant books, I guess, for people that don't come from the startup world. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, when I was reading the book, there were so many highs and lows. It was like I was on this roller coaster ride with him because something would go well for a bit and then it just goes bad again. It'll go well for a bit and it goes, and that's exactly how a startup is. So he was very honest about the whole roller coaster ride that happens in the startup world, right? And what is your opinion about the hardest thing you've had to undergo in being a startup? Well, I think, I mean, the hardest thing is definitely letting people go when things don't work out. I think that's that's really difficult, and especially because you have relationships with these people, and you know, and you understand um, as you work as you work long time with them that they have families, and you know, they have their own personal objectives, and you know, they look up to you, and you know, they they believe in you because you know, when you start something uh, new. Obviously, I don't have the reputation that larger companies have. So, you know, these people join the company not because of the perks, because you never can offer better perks than, you know, the, the rest of the companies out there. 
but it's because of you, because, you know, of how you convince them, because of what you promised them. And, and then, you know, when, when you need to let them go, uh, it hurts, right? It's very hard. And uh, um, I think some of them understand that it's a it's really difficult decision. Some of them would tell you, like, I understand, you know, they would be very mature in that way. And they would tell you, like, um, I understand this must be very difficult for you. And I appreciate you. But many of them don't, you know, and, and you know, they tell you that, you know, they're upset. And, you know, I see in people that they're uh, 10 years older than me that start crying, um, you know, and, and it's hard. It's very difficult. I, I, every time I need to do layoffs and I've done it three times so far in my career um three or four times and it, it's not like you wake up and you decide to do layoffs it's it's a decision that you know you need to do when you've been talking with the rest of the management team for a while and and trying to figure out a way not to do it but it's inevitable when you need to do it so the weeks before the layoffs it's very hard to sleep you know because you just keep on dreaming about firing these people and what's going to happen and how they're going to react and, and what's going to be the impact of the, on their lives and yeah, so I think, you know, everything else, it's hard. Um, but that is the hardest because it's people, right? It's uh, Otherwise, you know, you work, okay, let's say that you need to kill a product that you've been working on for six months. Of course, you have emotional attachment to that product. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, you know that you can build something better. And, you know, you're, you're taking some decisions. So you need to believe in yourself and, and the people around you. So I guess you can, you know, you're going to be a little bit upset for a day or two, but afterwards you're going to bounce back. But when you let people go, um, it's really hard. So I think for me, that's been the most difficult thing. The hardest thing about the hard thing is the layoff. Yeah. I, I agree. When you're dealing with people and human beings, their emotions, it it's just makes things so much harder. So in the book, um, Ben talks about how his company, Loud Cloud, was going through this phase of you know, it went from the hottest startup to being unfundable in six months due to the dot-com bubble crash. And they managed to raise private capital to survive temporarily, but eventually the most desperate option was to go IPO. So for those of you who didn't read it, I'll, I'll just tell you a quick snippet as well. The stock price crashed daily after they went IPO. And the best option then was to sell Loud Cloud to a company called EDS for 63.5 million in cash and then become a software company. And then what would happen was EDS would license the software to run both Loud Cloud and a larger EDS for 20 million a year. So that meant $20 million in the bag every year without fail for them. But that also meant laying off most of the workforce. And he wanted to ensure that he let go most of these people in a proper manner. So he said something that really hit me. He said, if I didn't treat the people who were leaving fairly, the people who stayed would never trust me again. So Victor, what do you think is the best way to treat people in times of stability, you know, where you have to do layoffs, for example, because like you said, in, in your startup career, you've had to do this three or four times. So how do you think is the best way to treat these people? Because they are people after all. Uh, uh, you know, of course there is, you know, a lot of uh, literature uh, written around how to how to lay people off. I, I don't want to be the best in this. Uh, it's not what I'm really striving for. I don't want to be the best person at letting people go. Um, so I'm not optimizing myself for that. I think what's more impactful is um, how you treat people since the moment they join the company until the end of their journey with you, right? Because it doesn't matter how professional, uh, considerate, careful you are in the way you let them go. Um, you know, all that matters is that what you have done for them before that, right? Uh, because I think these relationships that you build and, and the way you have been treating them and the opportunities you gave them to grow and, and how you've been nurturing them, I think, I think that's much more impactful. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that you need to be very careful in, in how you manage your team and you need to show them that you care. You need to show them that you want them to grow. You need to give them every opportunity to grow. I think you have, uh, uh, I mean, being a manager, it's a, it's great that you know you have this ability to really observe someone, learn what what are what are their strengths and weaknesses, and you know and work with them on improving that. So so when you're this kind of person and you've been supporting them throughout their journey, I think when the time comes, they would understand. They would understand that this is not um, a decision that you can avoid, and and you know if it comes down to that, well, it is what it is, right? So so they would be very understanding. Um, I think that's the first thing. Right. It's very important how you treat them throughout in, in good and bad, right? 
Um, then I think the second thing is that often, um, if it comes down to layoffs, what people don't understand is that because they're scared of doing them, because they don't like doing them, they're trying to minimize how many layoffs they want to do. I think if your company needs to do layoffs, you need to do as you need to consider that. Um, something bad has happened or has been happening for a while. And um, if you don't have a very clear thesis of, on how things are going to bounce back, you better fire more people. Mm -hmm. You need to cut deep, right? Because the last thing you want to do is, you know, okay, I'm going to let five people go this month and then next month things are not improving and I'm going to let another five people go because that that is just going to destroy the culture of the company and it's going to get very toxic. So um, I think that's another thing you need to consider. So um, how deep you need to cut so that the company can bounce back. And uh, I guess the last thing, and that's something we did at Greenhouse back in the days, is that when we let people go, um, we actually spent about two weeks before letting them go, uh, as you most probably remember, trying to find opportunities for these people. So, you know, just, just texting everyone in our network who is hiring, you know, we have some great people. And because many of our customers or partners, um, you know, they, they know us as a, as a good company with good people and they know that we're very selective. So they were very eager uh, to hire some of our people. So it happened that some of our best people, the moment we were like, you know, unfortunately this is what's going on we're like but by the way i already have a job for you yeah. right so i think that's also a way of course that that works when you have a when you have a small scale business if your business is thousands of people well then you know you can't really do that for everyone but then you know uh, what you can do is that you can build a great company with great reputation so then you know that's going to be good enough for other people to hire them yeah that's that's really smart because don't wait till you have to do layoffs and then think about how you're going to save your reputation, but rather build it from the beginning when you're hiring people, you know, how you treat them and things like that. So one of the things that they wrote in the book, I think there were six tips that they wrote. Um, again, for those of you who didn't read it, Ben mentions that when you have to do layoffs, get your head right, no matter what, times are hard, you, do, you have to do what you have to do, right? That's the first thing. And then second thing he said was, don't delay them before the word leaks, do the layoffs. And then third, be very clear about why you're laying off people. You're dealing with people, be clear about the narrative. And then the fourth thing he said was, train your managers to do it. Because if your managers hire these people, they should be the one who's laying it off. I think the employees deserve that much respect. And then he said, address the entire company and lastly be present for them so just like how Victor mentioned being present for them finding opportunities for them you know be human about it so Ben said something very similar along those lines as well um, I want to move on to something a bit more about towards the relationship that you have with people so I was talking about the summary of the book where LoudCloud was sold to EDS so EDS was not happy with the deployment of LoudCloud in the book, and they were losing deals to competitors. So Ben pushed his team and he told them, you know, go tell your husband and wife, Ben needs me at work, Ben needs me for the next six months. And he said, I'll buy you dinner, I'll stay with you, but this is the last bullet and we have to hit the target. So they worked harder than ever before to win proof of concepts. My question to you is, how do you find the line between having a good relationship with people and pushing them, especially in Asia where the culture is a bit more emotional, the way you talk to people matters. You know, I don't think that narrative that Ben did would work in, in a place like Asia, right? You gotta be very careful the way you message these kind of things. And I know you're the kind of people who has a good relationship with your team, yet you're able to push them. So how do you find that nice line how do you draw that nice line between those things yeah i think um i mean it's I, I wish i could just give you know one single answer that that works but uh i guess what's very important is that you're you're transitioning right you know in the book they talk about wartime versus peacetime ceo right you know so um you're suddenly in, in a war right like in you're fighting for the survival of the business. And I think the first thing you need to do is that, um, so assuming you've been through some layoffs and there are some other people that are staying. So uh, it, it starts with communicating, right? You know, like, as you said, be there for them, talk to them and, and tell them like, oh, you know, you you stayed with us despite everything because you're exceptional. You're one, you're one of the best, right? Not just here, but in, in the country, maybe in the region, uh, maybe globally, right? Depends on, depends on what kind of business you're running and, and 
and how good is your talent. So, um, you know, first of all, give them some confidence and, and be there for them. Then, you know, um, communicate often. And, and I guess, you know, once you have the foundation of that in place, um, next is, next what's important is that if you're going to go full speed, you know, and you're going to do, you're going to push everyone. I guess, you know, it's very important to show them that you're also doing that, right? It's not just that you're just demanding of them, but you're next to them on the front lines. And, you know, when you're like giving your 100%, you're earlier than them in the office, you stand too late. Because, you know, if you're going to make everyone work their ass off, you better work your ass off as well. Because, you know, if then they have any argument, like why you're pushing us so hard, then I'm like, I'm not pushing you more than I'm pushing myself. You know, I'm always pushing myself more than you. And if you feel that it's not fair, how much I have given you, you know, what I can take on my plate to help you, right? So just having this, you know, uh, constant communication and also being next to them and, you know, doing uh, whatever it takes, right? Um, to show that you care and you're going to get it done and, you know, and, and you're positive despite everything. Um, I think, you know, striking a balance between all this communication, leading by example, um, I think this is the sweet spot and, and that at least has helped in my case. But but yes, a Asia is very unique in the sense that um, you can't be too direct. You can't communicate this kind of things in public, meaning, you know, if it's a, if it's a group of people and, you know, one of the employees has failed you uh, because of misunderstanding or consciously or whatever. Um, I mean, the last thing you want to do is to, you know, like kind of point it out in front of everyone. Right. So, so there is very subtle ways you need to do it, very careful ways in certain situations. You need, you need to be good at, you know, reading their body language. You need to be good at understanding the culture. So, yeah, in Asia requires a lot more communication, a lot more uh, meetings um, to, to express something like that, right? Um, and to really show them that you mean the best for them, right? You don't just mean to give them more work, but, you know, by doing that, they're going to grow and the business is going to, you know, continue. So, yeah, it is, it is uh, very, very tricky doing it in Asia, but uh, there are ways. And I think uh, we have been doing a good job in, in COVID of, with that, even though we suddenly became a remote team, we couldn't meet everyone. We've been through layoffs remotely. So um, then, you know, it was just a matter of uh, being there for our team and showing them that, you know, we are at the front line with them, yeah. busting our ass and supporting them as much as we can. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really, really true. Um. And another thing that Ben mentions in the book, which I, I really want to know your opinion on, because I think when you're in a young company, this is bound to happen. And he said, when you're building the company, you must believe there is an answer. You cannot pay attention to the odds of finding it. You just have to find it. It doesn't matter if the chances are nine out of 10 or one out of 1,000 your task is still the same. And that's exactly what he said in the book. Especially on the days that you feel your odds are low, how do you push yourself forward, Victor? Because this is bound to happen in, in the startup world, in your position. How do you find that motivation to push yourself forward on the days that you yourself find that the odds are low? Yeah, um, it, it's... For every person is different, right? You know, everyone everyone has their own, I guess, habits of, you know, how they handle that. But uh, I was listening to this uh, podcast recently. I think I even shared it with you, where uh, the guest literally said, you know, when you start a startup, you're signing up uh, to be punched in the face every single day until the, until the end of, of your time with the startup, right? So, so that's a conscious decision that you're taking. You're going to be punched in the face and you need to be aware of that. Like, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be actually very hard. And whenever you feel things are getting better, um, as long as the business is doing well, it means that eventually things are going to go bad, right? Um, even, even if the company is growing, that doesn't mean it's easy. You know, handling growth is also very hard. So um, that's why I think it's very important that the people that start companies are very particular type of people, right? People that are not very positive and energetic are, I don't think they can be really good at, you know, running a startup because it's hard. It, it's really difficult, right? So you need to have this um, enthusiasm, this energy, you need to believe in what you're doing. Like you're starting a, a company because you want to solve a problem, because, you know, that problem has been bothering you for a long time, because you're well positioned to solve that problem, right? And if, if you have all that in place, I think, you know, that's what matters, right? That's what's going to position you. Um, 
to have the necessary energy. And of course, you know, what kind of co-founders you have, it's, it's, it's the same, like, you know, in a relationship, right? If you have, if you have a co-founder that's very negative, pessimistic all the time, complaining all the time, obviously, you know, that's not going to work, right? In our case, you know, um, our CEO, you know, Drew is one of the most energetic people, you know, you would meet him anytime, you know, any day of the week, Monday morning, Friday evening, and, you know, he would be so happy, so positive, you know, always like smiling. And, and I think that charges you with a lot of energy, right? So, so selecting, you know, who are the leaders in, in your organization, who are the people that are running the business and people that have a lot of reserves of energy and enthusiasm is very important because if you statistically look at how many companies actually survive and make a lot of money, it's very low, right? It, the probability is very low. So you should not pay attention to that. You, you know, as I said, you have started a business because you want to solve a problem. You need to believe in yourself. You need to believe in the decisions you're making and in the people you're surrounding yourself with. As long as you have that, I think, you know, uh, it gets, the struggle is not that hard, right? I mean, um, the lows are low, true, but also the highs are very high. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think the one thing I remember when I was in Greenhouse as well was just being able to feed off people's energy, right? If you're feeling that your odds for your team is a little bit low on a particular day or a week and you just feel like your chances are low in finding particular answers or solutions, you just feed off other people. And that's what a startup culture should be about. Everyone needs to be positive. Everyone needs to have that ability to uplift other people because if someone's down, someone needs to be up, you know, and that's where it, it finds that balance. Um, awesome. I want to move on to a part of the book, which is about a minute long. And these are for people who've not read the book. And it's a whole section about the struggle, right? So as we mentioned earlier on, this book is very real. He talks about struggles. He talks about real experiences, the roller coaster ride with the startup. But if there's one part of the book that really hit a nerve with me, it's got to be this one. So I'm just going to read it out. He says, the struggle is when you wonder why you started the company in the first place. The struggle is when you ask, when people ask you why you don't quit and you don't know the answer. The struggle is when your employees think you are lying and you think they may be right. The struggle is when food loses its taste. The struggle is when you don't believe you should be the CEO of your company. The struggle is when you know that you are in over your head and you know that you cannot be replaced. The struggle is when everybody thinks you're an idiot, but nobody will fire you. The struggle is where self-doubt becomes self-hatred. The struggle is when you're having a conversation with someone and you can't hear a word that they are saying because all you can hear is the struggle. The struggle is when you want the pain to stop. The struggle is unhappiness. The struggle is when you go on vacation to feel better and you feel worse. The struggle is when you are surrounded by people and you're all alone. The struggle has no mercy. The struggle is the land of broken promises and crashed dreams. The struggle is a cold sweat. The struggle is where your guts boil so much that you feel like you're gonna spit blood. The struggle is not failure, but it causes failure, especially if you are weak. Always, if you are weak. Most people are not strong enough. Every entrepreneur, Every great entrepreneur from Steve Jobs to Mark Zuckerberg went through the struggle and struggle they did. So you're not alone, but that does not mean that you will not make it. You may not make it. That is why it's the struggle. The struggle is where greatness comes from. And I read that and I get goosebumps because it's true. The struggle is where greatness comes from. If you struggle and you push through, it becomes a success story, right? So I really, really liked the way he wrote that part. And my question to you is, what do you think is most CEOs or C-level or executives, what do you think is their biggest struggle? What do you think is the reason why they fail most of the times, in your opinion? I, th I think that's a hard question. And I, I really li like this quote that you, that you just read. And there, there is another one that it's, it's much shorter, but I like. And there is this one guy that said, running a startup is like chewing glass and, and liking it. <laughs> Right. And, and I think, I think that's so true. Right. It, it's just because it's your choice, right. You know, no, no one is forcing you to do it. It's not like you have a gun in your forehead and, and you still need to do it. I mean, you still want to do it. Right. Despite all, all these challenges, I think, you know, for every person it's different, right. You know, um, we all have um, different personalities, you know, uh, for some people it's, I guess, 
uh, it's their status and how society looks at them. For some people, it's the relationships that they need to give up on. Um, you know, I think it, it really depends on what kind of person you are. It depends on how uh, big is your company and, and also how public is what you're doing, right? You know, there are some founders that like to um, run their businesses in a very public manner. And there are some founders that like to run their businesses in a very private manner. So you rarely hear from them, right? You know, so so for everyone, it's very unique and different. Um, but I think what, what has happened, I mean, not recently, but I guess in the past 10 years or so is that uh, because the access to venture capital is so much more than ever before, um, what's going on is that a lot more companies are getting funded, right? And uh, it's very loud when when there is a success, right? Or oh, this company fundraised that much, and that company fundraised that much, right? And it and you know every day, like if you follow tech news, you would hear about these companies that are fundraising a ton of money, and you'd be like, oh my god, you know what am I doing wrong, right? So so, so you know like you start thinking like how can all these companies out there be doing so well? And, you know, here we are, a bunch of, you know, smart people. I busted my ass to find the smartest people I could meet and get them on board. And yet here we are, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's very challenging, right? So I think what media is doing, you know, it's it's not great, right? Because it makes people feel that, you know, they're not doing a good job when, you know, well, sometimes that's the case, right? Sometimes absolutely we're not doing a good job being founders, but there is a lot of times when you are and it's just, you know, uh, it's not the right time for this product or, you know, like if, or if there's some, other external things that are like COVID, you know, there's a lot of great businesses that I'm sure were completely wiped out because of COVID, you know, and otherwise they would have survived. And there is some companies that managed to bounce back, uh, like Traveloka, for example. Traveloka was having a really difficult time, right? You know, they needed to fundraise, I believe, at a lower valuation during COVID. But now, what is now, October, November, mm-hmm. uh, we are actually seeing that, you know, they're reaching their pre-COVID uh, revenues. Mm-hmm. Um, so they managed to bounce back, right? So I think, you know, for every founder is very different. Um, I think it's hard to say. Like in my case, it's definitely, you know, the hardest thing is about is letting people uh, letting people go um, and just, just know, knowing that, that you let people down. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's very challenging, but it's hard to it's hard to answer it on behalf of, of everyone else. I think, you know, people are just so unique and different and they care about different things. Some people are incentivized by money big time. Some people are incentivized by status and fame and, that, and that's totally fine, right? You know, people are just different. Um, but yeah, I think everyone everyone has their own uh, unique view. Yeah, that's true. Great. Um, another thing that, that he wrote in the book, Ben, is like he said about failing, right? He said one of the best advice he heard was that when you fail, the media doesn't care, the investors don't care, your board doesn't care, not even your mama cares. Nobody cares. And a great reason for failing will not preserve $1 for your investors. It won't save your employees' jobs. It won't get you new customers. So instead of thinking about a reason for failing, use your mental energy to find the one seemingly impossible way to get out of your current mess. So don't spend time on what you could have done, but devote all your time on what you might do. What do you think about that? How do you get yourself to not spend time on the things that you could have done, but be more positive and think of all the things that you could do to, to make it work? How do you get yourself in that mindset? I, mean, I think it's a realization. You know, the moment it's past tense, it's, it's done. Yeah. That there is nothing in your control that you can do to, to alter that. You know, it is what it is, right? It happened. Um, I think it's important for you to reflect. I think it's important to find time to think about it and, and you know, kind of, you know, uh, consider what was wrong, what was right. But, you know, thinking too much about it doesn't bring any value, right? And, and it's very hard to also understand um, out of these experiences what exactly went wrong or right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's why a lot of people, even when they succeed, they struggle to understand what exactly caused the success, right? Because suddenly you see things in, in a very different light and, you know, suddenly things seem different. And you might say, well, you know, we had a great team, but a lot of companies have a great team, right? You know, so, so it's very hard to say what actually uh, in retrospect worked out or it didn't work out, right? So I think, you know, just this realization gives you so much, I don't know, like freedom and, you know, you can just move on and think about other things. Um, so I think that's, that's the most important, right? To not really consider um, what could have been different, but rather focus on the future and, and also, you know, explore explain to the team that's that's the way you 
think about it because you know you need to project it to everyone else and you need to convince them that they need to continue with that and and just a comment on the on the on failure and how how failure is perceived i think in different cultures and i think we, we chatted about that earlier this week in different cultures failure is perceived very differently right yeah. you know in in asian cultures failure is like oh my god it's like you know uh, you starting something and getting popular and then not working out it's so scary, right? You know, how your family is going to look at you, how your friends are going to look at you. Uh, I've seen people feeling suffocated by the idea. You know, just, just the idea, I can see their body language. It's so hard for them to think about it. And then we have, you know, the Western culture and, you know, North America in particular, where, you know, we have reached a point where, you know, failure is almost celebrated, right? And, you know, failure is good. Let's fail more, you know, because that's the only way to, uh, to get better. But I think, you know, we need to be somehow in the middle. And I think, you know, uh, we should never think that failure is great and we should never think that failure is terrible. We should be tolerant. We should be incredibly tolerant about failure, right? You know, because it happens. It's part of life and everyone goes through that. Um, some in bigger ways, some in smaller ways, but we all go through that. But we just need to be tolerant about it and understand that it happens. But thinking too much about it doesn't bring any value. So let's focus you know, on what we can do better. And I think for that, it's important to spend a bit of time, you know, uh, to slow down on whatever you're doing you know, reconsider everything that happened and, and try to come up with, you know, the path ahead. Um, that's why it's good, you know, from time to time, take a break, you know, like, like take a holiday or something like that. Because if, you, because the start of feels like a marathon, you're constantly running, you know, there is always something coming in. You never slow down, right? You never slow down to reflect. So I, I think that's a mistake that most of us do. I, I, in particular, I'm going on a holiday next week and I have booked my mornings every day. We can sync through that to work. All right. And that's not the best, but but I'm getting better. There was a time I would book the entire day. Now I'm booking like two, three hours a day. Exactly. So it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but you're right. It is it is something that we need to find a fine line between, you know, celebrating it to an extreme, like how certain cultures do, and not even thinking about it or being scared of it in certain cultures. And another thing he said in the book that I really like was the most important thing. I learned as an entrepreneur was to focus on what I needed to get right and to stop worrying about all the things that I did wrong or might do wrong, right? So these are for people who are, I guess, a bit more afraid of failure and, and things like that. So I just wanted to put it out there. Now, moving on to, to another thing that I want to talk about, and some of you might relate to this, right? He said, I thought it was my, only my job to be thinking about the company's problems. But if I was thinking clearly, I would have realized that it didn't make sense for me to be the only one to worry about the product not being right, because I was not the one writing the code. So what it would have been smarter was to give it to the people who could not only fix it, but who would be personally excited and motivated to do so. So I just want to put it out there because I'm that kind of person who would be in a company and, and I remember being like this, be like, you know, just give it to me, I'll fix it, I'll do everything. And I wouldn't really delegate it to my team. Do you feel like it's your responsibility to fix all the problems in the team? Or are you the kind of person who's able to trust your team, delegate it, trust that they will do it well? What kind of person are you in, in general when it comes to, to, to this? Do you think it's always your problem to um, fix everything? Yeah, well, uh, how to say, when you start something and you're one of the first people in the business, you have this uh, very, at least I do, I have this sense of responsibility and accountability of, you know, it's my responsibility. And if it doesn't work out, I can't say, well, but it was that lady that it was, it was on her table, right? Yeah. She should have done it, but it, it, no one cares. As you said earlier, there was a quote, you know, your mom, your mother doesn't care, your, the media doesn't care. No one fucking cares, right? Uh, it, it's, it's all about getting the job done. So because of that mindset, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes I do feel like that I'm a bit more, uh, it's hard to give away. And it's also because sometimes I feel that I'm giving too much away. And my team is like, oh my God, because it's a startup. And rather than in a regular company, they would work on one thing. But here we are uh, working across these 20 different projects. And I'm like, oh my God, maybe I'm going to burn them. Maybe they're going to leave me, right? And, and then I'm not going to have this great employee. Right. So uh, I do have, I do think that I can do better at delegation. Um, but also I do think that it comes with the people that you hire, right? Because as you hire people, you know, you, you get to know what, what they're capable of, right? You get to understand how much you can delegate and, and how much, you know, uh, you need to supervise. There are certain people that I'll be very comfortable giving everything. And there are certain people that 
I I wouldn't be like you know when we work together I was very comfortable you know giving to you like I knew that whatever I give you no matter how complex it is yes you're gonna chase me to <laughs> figure it out inside out but once you figure it out you're gonna get it done right and and I didn't need to follow up I didn't need to ask for reports I didn't need to you know chase you I just knew that you're gonna do it right so when you hire smart people that are very capable you know very ambitious they get it done right and and I think a, a big problem in Asia in particular is because, you know, it's quite affordable everywhere else other than Singapore, but in any other country, it's very affordable to hire people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you fundraise in Singapore, then you come here, you know, and you hire a lot of people, but hiring a lot of people doesn't, doesn't bring necessarily, you know, a lot of value. In fact, it creates more complexities because people are difficult and, you know, like sometimes they just actually slow down things rather than improving things. So I, I think how most startups should think about that is that they need to hire extremely rarely. They need to do as much as they can on their own because also the good people that are really capable and, you know, they can, they can work across um, like, cause early on in a startup, I think there is this concept of T-shaped people. Mm -hmm. So like the, the letter T, right. You know, whereas, you know, the, the upper part of the letter shows um, the, the breadth of, you know, how much, a person can do like, you know, all the way from social media to, you know, running ads to, you know, selling to, you know, fundraising to every fucking department. Like you can, you can, you can get involved and you can get the job done. And then, you know, um, the, the bottom part of the letter represents, you know, how good you are in a few things, right? Being exceptionally good, like no one else in one or two things. Yeah. Um, so as long as you hire people like that, that are T-shaped, um, I think, you know, it's going to be much easier for you to manage them because communication travels very easy when you're five, 10 people versus when you're 30 people. And when people are smart, they figure it out. They don't come to you, they don't ask you questions, you know, they, they, they get a problem and they will just figure it out. So no one's gonna say, okay, but, but that's not my responsibility. They would just feel bothered that something is not fixed. They would yeah. spend their weekend, they would solve it and they would solve it in a way that you're gonna be like, oh my God, like I did not expect that this is possible. And especially in, in tech companies, you see that a lot. You see people coming up with uh, solutions that you didn't expect to be possible because you know they had this huge challenge that you know if you had resources, most probably you would just invest a ton of money in solving it. But because they were pressured in the corner and, and they didn't know how to how else to solve it, you know, they figured out something very creative. So because of that, I think hire a few people, exceptional people, you know, and I think that can take you actually very far. Um, because we, we live in very different times, right? It's not like the industrial age anymore where, you know, every person can produce that many, I don't know, blazers or that many shirts, right? Now, now it's all about, you know, one person can be as, as good as 100 people. You know, I was, I was reading this uh, book, uh, uh, the latest book that Netflix published, and, they, and Netflix found out that the, uh, an exceptional developer, so like in top 10 in the world, so one of the best in the world, is 22 times better than a very good developer. Wow. That's very expensive. Yeah. And that very good developer is who knows how many times better than you know a very average or mediocre exactly. developer, right? So sometimes they would, you know, literally what Netflix would do is that they would fire an entire team of developers to hire one person because they're like, you know, that person can deliver 22 times more than these three other people that have been here. So uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a lot about recognizing that, understanding that and, and, and being careful how many people you hire because then, you know, you're not going to be worried that much about all that. And again, I'm very biased to talk about the early days of a startup. This yeah. is where I've been. I never ran a huge organization. I'm sure that, you know, things are changing quite a bit when you reach that scale. Uh, but that's my experience of running uh, either pre-product market fit or product market fit businesses. Yeah, 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 that's, that's really, really relevant. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about that, you know, hiring few people, exceptional people, of course, it's quite hard because it takes a while to find that exceptional gem, right? So Ben talks about how he struggled to hire head of sales. And there was a terrible track record. And we've been through that as well, right? When we had to hire. And that's when he decided, you know what, I'm going to do that job and find out what that job entails. So he, as a CEO of the company, was doing a job of a salesperson so that he could understand the characteristics that make up that job so that he could hire the right person, right? What do you think? Because I know you're the kind of person who's humble enough to do a job that you're not hired to do because you know, that's the mindset you have. But a lot of C-level people are not like that, right? What would you give, what advice would you give to people, C-level executives in a startup who need to do a job 
that they're not hired for. In fact, it's a job of someone below them. You know, what, what kind yeah. of advice would you give them? I've been an interim head of sales for, for, for the past <laughs> three years, I think, you know, like, I mean, yeah. uh, I never got hired for that role, but I was always responsible for that. So, yeah. and as you said, we, we struggle so much to, to find a good head of sales. That's such a hard role. And I think um, in the early days of, of a startup, you should never outsource that because the insights that you get from conversations with clients are just invaluable, right? You know, um, that, that's not something you can learn. That's not something you can record and watch because talking to real people and then pushing back and coming up with all kinds of crazy requirements or, or interesting insights that you never considered, I think that's invaluable. So I actually would encourage any C-level person, you know, there is a few areas in the business that they need to be very involved. And one is product, another is sales, right? And then recruitment. And of course, fundraising, but you know, there is no one else to do the fundraising. So it, 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 it comes without saying. Um, but yeah, I do think that it's important because that gives you invaluable insights and these insights can be translated into product, right? And if sometimes, um, if sometimes you have the necessary insights, but you know, it's just a temporary thing that you need to do. Once again, I do think it's going to help you to really understand what kind of person you need to hire. And when you meet that person, it's going to be crystal clear. That's the person, right? And, and there is, you know, certain questions you can ask to understand that. And there is a lot of really good uh, blogs and content in general written about, you know, what kind of questions you can ask people when you're hiring them to see whether they're a good fit or not. Um, but nothing beats the experience of you've been doing the job. Right. And, and you just, just understand it so well. And, and I think it's very valuable, right, for the entire organization, for the health of the business. So sales and product are, are two things that the founders need to be very involved in. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I think when you're hiring people for a startup at the C-level, it's very different when you hire someone from a more established organization because they're not used to doing that. It's very different, right? So they might come into a startup going, this is not what I was hired for. And that's why hiring T-shaped people or hiring people who are willing to do that job, you know, that is something that every single startup needs to be very wary of. Um, but yeah, that's the awesome. lack of structure. The yeah. lack of structure kills people, you know, some people just hate it, you know, like, and, you know, your commission changing because, you know, like we're figuring out the product, we're figuring out our value and I'm changing your commission from a quarter to quarter and you, and, you know, some people will be very pissed, right? And there's, there'll be these other people that would be understanding, but it's hard to find them. So um, it's just, it's just, you know, it's very different game early on and, and it, it's really tricky to find the right people. Yeah, it's funny. It bugs some people, but some people thrive on it. Like I thrive on having, I need my life to be structured, but I'm okay having being in an unstructured company because I want to structure it, right? So there, it's interesting how it bugs some people to the core, not having structure within a company, but some people really thrive on it. People like yourself, people like other people you work with in the company, they just want to fix those things and be part of that, right? So hiring those people, hiring as few people as possible like that is just the way to go as, as Victor mentioned. Great, well, we've, we've wrapped up talking about the book, talking about some really relevant learnings from the book, talking about your learnings of being in a startup. And I'm super grateful for all those learnings. And I'm sure a lot of people would be as well, especially people in very similar positions as you. Before we wrap up, I wanna ask you, if there was one more book that you would recommend to listeners that you have learned from, which one would that be and why? On today's topic, if, if people want to dig deeper into that, I do think the latest Netflix book is pretty interesting. Yeah. It's Netflix acts like a startup despite its size. It's so interesting. It's so unconventional. It's very different. And the bar is really high. Um, I think it, it really makes you question you know, how you think about running a business and, and relationships with people and building a culture. And their culture deck is one of the, I would say the most popular culture deck in the world. So the book really goes deep into that. Uh, it's called No Rules Rule. Um, it, it's, it's an incredible book and th what they did differently because there is a few books on, on the topic of their culture deck. Uh, what they did differently this time is that they involve someone that's an expert on culture. Okay. So um, there is a lot of chapters that talk about how does that translate around the world and how is it different to do it in Singapore? They have concrete cases of, you know, employees in Singapore getting pissed at uh, American culture and vice versa and in other, in other um, cultures around the world. So I do think this is a good follow-up read on what we talked about. Nice. Great. Good one. And the very last question I have for you today, which I'm going to be asking every guest is, 
a lot of people ask, oh, what is the biggest regret in your life? And, you know, things like that. But I want to know, because this is a podcast about people improving themselves. This is about people doing a bit of inner work, reading, improving, and trying to push themselves forward. So we're trying to be as positive as possible. So if I had to ask you, what is the best decision that you have ever made in your life where you go, you know what, I am so glad I made that decision and you are proud of it. What would that be? I knew this is coming. So I have prepared a bit because uh, otherwise I think it would have been a bit hard to answer. Yeah. Um, I think there is a lot of good decisions that I have made. Um, so, but, but the thing that comes to my mind first is my decision to actually go and study abroad. And, you know, for some people, that's something that's forced on them from their parents. And, you know, I've I seen a lot of people like that, that they never liked it and it wasn't as meaningful as for me. But, you know, I come from a, from a very poor neighborhood in a Eastern European country. And in that neighborhood, most people don't go to university at all, right? And, and my parents, I'm the first in our family that ever been to university, right? So um, I always wanted to outgrow the neighborhood because, you know, in my neighborhood, uh, the fact that I was reading wasn't really cool, to be honest. Uh, people didn't really look up to me back then. And even today, I don't think it's uh, people that read a lot are, are um, really appreciated there. Yeah. So um, the decision to, to study abroad was very hard because obviously we could not afford it. So when I mentioned it for the first time to my parents and they were like, who's going to pay for that? Like, like this is just, it's just beyond possible, right? They were like, you know, no one's going to support you. Like, this is, this is just ridiculous, right? But, you know, but I, I believe that as long as I really want it, it's going to happen. And, you know, I, I worked a lot and I saved a bit of money. And at some point, my parents realized that it's something I really want. So they were like, you know, well, we're going to do whatever we can to support you. And I think by moving abroad, that, that just changed my entire mindset, right? You know, just opened an entire new world. If I did not make that decision back then, I wouldn't know you. Yeah. I wouldn't have worked with the people I know. Uh, I wouldn't... Um, meet some incredible people around the entire world. I wouldn't grow that much. Um, I wouldn't be able to tap into uh, the tech sector. I, I don't think I would. I don't think anyone does it back home. I mean, nowadays, yeah, there is, you know, more and more tech startups. But um, many, many years later, right? So the fact that I studied abroad, I traveled half the world. I lived in six countries. And that's because of this one decision that, yes, it was very difficult. And most people laughed at me, you know, like my friends laughed at me. Uh, my parents, they never laughed at me, but they were just a bit like, what the fuck? Uh, but a lot of friends were laughing and they were like, you can't speak English very well. Um, you can't afford it. It's just stupid. Why would you, why would you, why, why do you keep repeating that? But, you know, I did it and um, now I see the benefits, right? It just opened an entire different world. And, and now I'm such a global citizen, right? Yeah. Living across many countries and knowing a lot of incredible people. And yeah, I think that single one choice back then is what uh, brought me here. Yeah, that's, that's really great because you wouldn't be where you are today if not of that one decision, right? It has just completely spearheaded you. Are you comfortable enough telling our listeners how old you are? Um, you don't I'm, have to. I'm 29. Okay. I'm 29 uh, and in one month, I'm going to be 30. Like, yes. and like, Victor, in, a, in a month and one week. Awesome. And Victor is a chief operating officer of a company, guys. So at the age of... 29 turning 30 to be at that position he's obviously done something right awesome so just to wrap this up this is exactly why i started this series you know speaking to people like you who read and learn to help you make better decisions personally and professionally and your humility will always be something that i admire you're not complacent to learn and that's what makes you an intropreneur it's our vision to inspire more people to become entrepreneurs so that they can work towards their goals by learning from the best like you. So thank you for your time today, Victor. For those of you who want to connect with Victor or you think you want to do business with greenhouse.co, you may find his details in the description below. Thank you. Take care and see you thank guys. Thank you. That, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.